There are hundreds of videos that haven't been launched on YouTube on Patreon. Make sure you guys join the Patreon to help us grow. We are Myth Vision. Atheism. Atheism. The lack of belief in the divine or deities, a deity. Is that what it really means? Well, we're going to talk about atheism. Everything atheism is going to be about this show. And Tom Jump is, uh, I like to say, an upcoming I think you're going to be replacing one of the four horsemen at some point, fingers crossed. <laughs> but no, you debate a lot on the topic, and I really appreciate what you bring, making people think you're challenging yourself in this process, and you're thinking, and you're getting a lot of people that are like PhDs or that are scholars in the field, and you're holding your own quite well. So welcome to Myth Vision Podcast, brother. Thanks. Thanks for inviting me on. I appreciate the opportunity, as always. Yeah, thanks for coming on last time. I really do appreciate it. My fans, of course, love you. I think we got a lot of overlap in many ways. Also, um, go to his YouTube channel, guys, T-Jump. He does a, he's done a ton of debates. He's still doing debates. You guys can help him out. Subscribe, like the videos, comment on the videos. The algorithm likes that stuff so that people like him can get promoted and grow and get this information out there for more people to think rationally, considering that maybe we're superstitious and we need to start growing out of that some. And you're big about attacking these things, not attacking. I don't want that to sound like a negative thing, but you are going headstrong on tackling irrational concepts and ideas. You've debated Hindus. Uh, it looks like the, the last guy I was watching live yesterday that was premiered on yours was a Hindu. Yep. Of uh, course, yeah, Hare Krishna, Krishna, which is technically, I mean, because Hinduism isn't really well defined. There's a bunch of different, I mean, he's specifically a Hare Krishna. Okay. I, you know, I got to be careful. You know how that goes. They'll say, you're straw manning my belief. Um, but yeah, you, you do a lot of that stuff. So he also has a patron. You know, Myth Vision has a patron. He has a patron. What's How much is it to join your patron? Uh, I think the one dollar is the lowest, or two dollars, one or two. Cup of coffee, guys, go join. Or, or just go you, with the hundred, a thousand, put a thousand in there. Like I'm cool with that too. Yeah, that'll actually get you points in the atheist heaven. But we'll talk about atheist heaven after we talk about how irrational the other concepts of heaven are. <laughs> Dude, uh, welcome, man. Thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely. I'm glad to be on. As always, I'm still jealous of your hair. It's quite much better <sighs> than my hair. <laughs> Dude, I've been doing something. I don't even know what it, I don't know what I'm doing with my hair, man. I, I just, I don't know. I don't know. Some days I wake up and just figure something out and throw it up there. I get people who comment sometimes like, you don't know what you're doing with your hair, but great show. I'm like, <laughs> okay. But dude, I have to admit, I got to ask you a secret before we get into this. Are the answers that you're coming up with truly coming from the chair sitting behind you? Are there, is it whispering the answers to you? It's definitely the fifth. Okay. Okay. You guys know the answer to that. You know, it. comment if you know the answer to that. Um, <laughs> dude, atheism, uh, Christians want to, I want to start with the definition here. And and I've watched so many of your debates and man, one of them, it just kind of irks me that they want to spend 50 minutes out of an hour and a half to try and tell you what atheism means for you. It, it's killing me, man. Uh, so what is atheism? It is the worship of magical potatoes. <laughs> Yeah, it's a, it's a pretty interesting debate uh, tactic to say that, uh, well, your position is this, and I'm going to tell you what your position is, and you have to defend the position I just told you to defend, because that's that's essentially what theists have to do, is, is one of the ways they deflect the burden of proof is by trying to make the atheist hold up a position that they don't really hold. The whole point of atheism is that all of the theist arguments are crap. That is That is atheism. Atheism is essentially just the position that everything the theists are saying, they're full of shit. That's it. Uh, so that's why we try to put it into a more technical term to say that like there is no reason to believe in God or we lack belief because there's no evidence or whatever. But the real reason is just all the things they theists there are just complete crap. They're just they're just made up, and we call them out on that. That's kind of the point of atheism is to say that all the stuff that theists are saying doesn't make sense. The arguments don't work. Uh, the evidence they claim to have doesn't justify any of their claims. It doesn't work in any of the other fields. It's rejected in the consensus of every academic field. There's no evidence to support it whatsoever. And yet the theists want to come back and say that, oh, well, all of this stuff is reasonable to believe in their sky daddy, which it's not. And when the atheists say that and say, all oh, that's just junk, uh, well, the theist wants to come back and say, well, no, to be an atheist, you have to reject God. You have to prove God doesn't exist. See, if you can't right. prove he doesn't exist, well, then he does. Ha 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 ha. 
Evading or that you have a belief, world. like you have a belief in the negation of a God. And it's like they create, they want it to become a religion of its own. And that's what they do. They do that. Yeah, exactly. Cause they don't want to have to address the claims that their arguments are bull crap. So if you, if you say like that argument is terrible, they don't want to have to defend their argument because they realize they're going to lose every time in that debate because the atheist positions are significantly stronger and their arguments are absolutely terrible. So what they do is they shift the burden of proof to say, oh, but you have to prove God doesn't exist. That's, that's, that's how we can win the argument. So we're going to force you to defend a position that isn't really your position. Yeah. That's, <clears throat> that, that gives me a headache every time because it's like, <sighs> I feel like uh, in when I watch, I try not to be biased. I really do try. We all have it. It's natural. I am biased. I am an atheist. Um, I'm someone who doesn't believe in a God. I did. I don't believe in any divine. Could there be something? Sure, possibly, but that's outside of my realm of being able to prove and having no evidence for such a thing. I just can't justify believing in that, and that's okay with me. Um I understand that mostly from my understanding where I was at as a theist was more emotional. Uh, that that's really one of the reasons I held on to the divine, almost like a child does with their invisible friend or with, uh, there's a psychological, you know, teddy bear experience with your teddy bear. You create a friend for yourself and really you're talking to yourself. I found that out as I was praying to get off heroin five years ago. I thought it was God that helped me and I got off heroin, which I look back and I go, wow, man, I was talking to myself. Like I was in a desperate survival mode and the social construct of having people to talk to helped save my ass too. But I wanted to get into the important part of this. I feel like in your debates, I want to say to the, to the theist, guys, just give the answer. Just, just if there's an answer, just give it. And they do all this stuff around the thing that you guys are just directly assuming and saying, and it's like, I, it's hard to describe, like, can they not just answer? Why can't they just give you the thing to directly answer or to directly combat what you're suggesting? What's going on there? Have you witnessed that? Do you see what I'm talking about? Yeah, there's a, a number of different issues there. Some of them are like, even when I'm talking to atheist philosophers, communication skills is not something many people have. So I was talking with Alex Malpass and Ozzy, Ozzy, I forget, Ozzy Ramsey, something, something, the third, the, but they're, they're professional philosophers, but they're really bad at talking. They, they uh, when they're explaining a the point, they take a long time to try and articulate the point and it it gets lost in all the complicated terminology. So the ability to clearly articulate a point concisely is very rare. Uh, among people I've learned from YouTube. And so that's one of the issues why they can't get straight to the point. They're just not not good, not skilled enough at communication. Another is the fact that when they're trying to figure out how to give a weaker answer. So, so if they can't give like, well, what is the evidence for the cup? Well, here it is. It weighs this much. You can see it. And they have to find some other roundabout way to articulate it. They end up filibustering and bringing up lots of different terms that sound really nice to make them like the woo doctors on YouTube, you see them talking about, oh, the you got to get in touch with your chi and the universe and, and the feeling <laughs> stuff. And they use all these ridiculous words that mean absolutely nothing, like quantum mechanical references, because it it makes what they're saying seem meaningful. Because if they say it confidently and say words that are uh, have six syllables in them, it makes them think they're smart or feel that they're smart. And the makes the people who aren't, don't know what those terms mean also think they're smart. So it, that that technique is used by theists just like it's used by the crazy guys uh, on YouTube who just talk about woo all the time. That that brings up a great point. <clears throat> the, some of these people are very sophisticated that you've talked with, and I've heard them. A lot of them are philosophers or at least study philosophy pretty deeply. Others that have these credentials and I listen to them speak, I'm like, dude, they, it almost sounds like, what are they going to school for? Because they're not learning anything, it sounds like to me. But I ask you, what are some of the best uh, arguments you've heard on the theist side? And they come so close, maybe, but then you realize that they just did a 180, like right at the end. Do you have anyone that you've talked to that you're like, you know what, that you're getting close to something that could make sense, but that's where you make a leap of faith at that point, and you just you, you lost me. Yeah, there's there's two decent arguments that the theists use. One is the contingency argument. So everything that is contingent has a cause. There has to be some necessary thing as the foundation of the universe. That makes a lot of sense. That's one of the big logical possibilities of what caused the universe is a necessary thing. 
And then they make the logical jump. Well, that necessary thing is Yahweh. It's a mind. It has intentions. It created purpose for us. It created Jesus and then uh, made a magical rib woman who was convinced by a talking snake to eat from a magical tree. I get, they're making these, <laughs> these leaps uh, that aren't, aren't there. So I can agree that there's a necessary thing. That makes perfect sense. That's definitely one of the possibilities. But we can't go from that to say what the necessary thing is. Right. And there's another the argument is that is uh, DNA is a code. The only codes we know of are made by a mind. Therefore, DNA is made by a mind. That's actually a reasonable argument. So it's it's in, if we just discovered DNA yesterday and we knew nothing else about it other than it's a really complicated code, that's a reasonable argument. Like you could infer that maybe that maybe life was made by a mind. Uh, but s- subsequently, after we discovered it, we've made a lot of testable predictions that says if it's made by natural processes and abiogenesis, then we should be able to see these processes occur in natural circumstances like the RNA uh, corpuscles forming on clay and how the bonds of the nucleotides formed in DNA. And we can we can see these in the lab. We've demonstrated them. We know that these things are completely explained by abiogenesis because the natural hypotheses made these predictions that we would see this in the lab, and we did, whereas intelligent science made no predictions at all. It's almost like the argument they're making is nature itself is God. And of course, they're not saying that, but the metaphysical behind all of that, some might argue he's in time and space. Some might say, or it is in time and space. It is outside of time and space. Uh, This is where I've heard the argument come from inspiring philosophy. Yeah. Did I get that correct? Yeah. 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 And he's debating Matt Delahunte and he he's arguing the mind argument. Uh, we have a mind, uh, minds are there. Therefore there's probably this greater mind out there that is made these things. And I've heard his argument with Matt. He's a smart guy. He's a sharp guy. Um, but where do you see fall fall in, in what he's trying to suggest? Do you see him making huge leaps or. Oh God, he makes unbelievably huge leaps inspiring philosophy is a special breed of apologist so he, he he's an idealist he thinks consciousness is fundamental to everything like there's only consciousness there's no matter matter is just a product of consciousness mm-hmm. he has a very strange view and uh, he's he cherry picks a few academic papers so he goes a little bit further than most apologists because most apologists just say william lane craig said this we'll, we'll go with that yeah but ip actually does does do the research into his position to find uh physicists who support the same ideology he does there's very very few of them extremely few of them but they do have published papers and so he finds those published papers and then uh, builds an entire worldview around those little bits of evidence that he can find to try and construct a a plausible uh basis for his worldview and so he, he goes to a lot of mental gymnastics to try and build build up his worldview and justify it by finding academic papers in every niche place you can possibly look because academics are people just like anybody else. And so you can find crazy academics who believe crazy things and you can find a paper to support pretty much anything you want. Uh, That's why we have to defer to the consensus. What do the majority of experts in the field think about this topic? Whereas he doesn't, he he finds those cherry picked papers and says, aha, I have a really supported worldview here because I can find these really, really, well-educated, well-informed people in the field who support my position in like one or two papers here and there. Why do you think he does that? Do you think uh, it's once again an emotional attachment to a sacred held belief he is only trying to validate by only finding evidence that supports his premise and not really trying to poke holes using a scientific method? Yeah, it's it's the Pine Creek, uh, the Pine Creek theorem. Apologists do apologetics to so they, they have an excuse to not feel stupid about believing in a God. Interesting. So let me ask you this. The fundamental <clears throat> thing is either everything uh, existed forever or somehow in some shape, some form. This is usually what, what people will argue when it comes to atheism. And they'll go, no, the Big Bang prior to that. Boom. God made it. OK, I think everything in some way, shape or form existed Forever. Uh, I don't think there was a time before using the word time. Goodness gracious. Be careful when you use that anachronistic term that we use when the sun rotates or the earth rotates about the sun. But we see in a 24 hour period, we use the term time. What I'm saying is, is I think that there was never an initial absolute ex nihilo beginning from everything. There's something that always was. They want to say God. (laughs) Do we have better explanations? 
Uh, well, a magical potato would be a better explanation than a god. So, uh, <laughs> yes. Uh, but yeah, the more plausible explanations are starting from where we're at. So what we know exists, matter. And combining those in every way we can to see if anything that of the stuff we know about could potentially explain what caused the Big Bang. And there are theories that do that, like the cyclic universe theory, the multiverse, the many worlds, emergent space time. There's all kinds of those theories. And each of those theories, what makes it fundamentally different from a religious belief is that they're all combinations of principles, particles, and laws that have already been verified to exist. So it's like if you see a horse print in the snow and you say, well, what caused it? Say probably a horse. Well, horses, since we already know they exist, it's a decent explanation. But if you said unicorn, I mean, that's, no, there's no reason to believe a <laughs> unicorn did it because we've never confirmed a unicorn. So if you have an explanation that's based on or combined of all the things we already know exist, that's always going to be a better explanation than if you're inserting something new that has no evidence whatsoever. And so all of the physics theories are significantly better, more plausible explanations of the Big Bang than the God hypothesis, which is why the vast majority of cosmologists and physicists don't think God had anything to do with the Big Bang, to quote Sean Carroll in his debate with William Lane Craig. Powerful, man. You put that real well put. I, I'm, that's where I'm at. I'll say this in simple, dumb, dumb terms because <clears throat> I don't know all the, ling the, the language and the lingo and all the scientific stuff that you do. And you're aware of this, this far more than I am. But to me, it's like when I stopped believing uh, in Jesus, one of the things was comparative religion that made me start to compare my God to other gods. That was the stepping stone I needed to exit because I was like, hold on. Jesus, why is Jesus true and really performed these things and did these things? But so and so and so and so and so and so isn't, and this God and that God, why am I right and they're wrong? I started to go from that approach out. And then I, at first, because I couldn't let go of the idea of God and having an emotional attachment, not knowing where to place that emotion and realizing there was life after religion, I, I started to realize that <clears throat> looking at the critics like yourself and others, who are saying there's a natural explanation for these things and which makes more sense, something we can look at, observe, test, know, or hocus pocus. And which one makes more sense is something that can be testable, observable. If it is supernatural, um, you know, I'm not going to say it can't be testable because there are ways to, you know, observe things and say, dude didn't have an arm for 19 years. We know for a fact he didn't have an arm and now he has an arm. We could, we could prove things. There's ways that God could show and prove, but I started to see natural explanations to fit better. And so that's what I started to do. And I guess my question to you would be, you come from a similar background, I suspect, the Judeo-Christian worldview. What was your stepping stone? What personally for you uh, started making you become more and more naturalist and an atheist? Uh, well, my conversion really didn't have anything to do with uh, science or philosophy. I was I had severe depression, major depression my entire life. And I prayed to a God every morning, every night for help. And after years and years of nothing, I just stopped being able to believe there was this all-powerful, all-knowing, all-loving being up there. And that's when I really stopped believing in a God. And it wasn't until years later that I got into philosophy from watching Hitchens, Harris, Dawkins, and the Four Horsemen and learning about epistemology via them, essentially. And now, like honest, this is personal, obviously. Are you happier now than you ever were? Uh, no, still still major depression. Still got the depression, but more hopeful because I have a moderately successful YouTube channel, which gives me slightly better hopes. Still still need a hot brown girlfriend to make me feel like, yes, I can finally <laughs> be happy now. Someone to sit next to you on the couch while you're debating? Yep. <laughs> Look, man, that that's uh, I know that's personal, and I really appreciate you answering that question because I work in a field with mental health, and I see it all the time. And most struggling drug addicts who are trying to get clean are religious or think the only way out is a higher power, and what they define as a higher power is some magic, you know, fairy dust, uh, Yahweh, or some other deity, Jesus, who knows, to try and get them, you know, from ever having to use drugs or alcohol again. And I honestly believe that my skepticism. And becoming a critical thinker and a naturalist, depending on what we can observe, test, and experience would, you know, I'm not, not, let me repeat experience. I don't mean, you know, people have experiences. That's not well, what I, I mean. If, if you have the right drugs, you can experience anything. Trust me. I know all about it. <laughs> and you probably do too. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I'm not saying that. I'm saying things that we can really know. And I like what you said. Um, you're optimistic because science, I think, will solve some of the problems with mental health that religion never will. So I'm a big uh, fan of what you do. And thank you for doing that and saying that. Um, 
where do you see us heading? Because it seems like most people are religious and superstitious. It's been that way for thousands of years. I'm reading a book, Battling the Gods right now. I think it's Brian or Tim Mar Whitmarsh. And I'm actually going to be interviewing this, this guy on the channel. So I can't wait. It's going to be great. Um, he points out that it's very hard to find atheists in the ancient world, but he does it. And he shows you people who battled the gods. They they refuse to to acknowledge these deities as Sclepius and you name it, all the different great gods and other worldviews. But mainly the Greeks had more literature that's preserved. So it's been going on for a long time. Do you see us eventually becoming more atheistic in the future? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, we're seeing a trend even in, especially in America right now where the religious uh, percentages are dropping off and the non-religiouses are taking over. Uh, and that's not a adoption of hard atheism. They're just not being as religious anymore, which will then, of course, lead to more uh, hard atheism like in the more uh, Western European countries, which do have predominantly atheists or non-religious people. But I think it's going to take a few larger stepping stones, like a few more Darwins. Like we need a Darwin for morality because that's essentially the biggest foothold or the second biggest foothold religion has is morality. If they can say that we have an objective morality and you don't, then that is something that they have, can have an emotional attachment to that gives them a reason to be religious. And if we can solve that in a secular way, that would be like a Darwin who just came back and said, no, that idea that all life came from a designer, that's dumb. Here's a much simpler explanation and you're done and just crush it. So if we get, if we get one more Darwin for uh, morality, that'll essentially put probably the final nail in the coffin for religion. That's a well said. I, I, I think about that myself. And I think um, humanitarians, you know, people who are secular humanist and such, they have an attachment to try and help humans in some way. There seems to be an emotional attachment to just trying to help humans for the sake of helping humans. But, you know, this is this is personal information. The other day, my wife still struggles with the whole idea of evolution. And evolution ties a huge role into a lot of today, what we would call atheism, of course, in understanding how we came to be. And my wife was still like, I don't know, you know, because we, we were big into religion. She never gives a crap. Like you said, she's not religious, but she's not educated in it. So we sat out here in the garage and I turned on some animal channels with the uh, certain uh, breed of monkeys are doing their thing. And people are filming from different angles, observing over weeks or whatever. And they go to war. And there's love and there's sex and there's everything you can imagine that humans go through and they're fighting and they name them and they know who the brother and sisters are and all that. She's like, they're acting just like us. I mean, so it started to make her like think, hold on, are we like genetically connected to these, these species? Like it didn't dawn on her. I think, um, I think it's natural to see even religious people do bad things. And sometimes those moral standards they hold to end up actually being self-defeating, like priests and others who are molesting children and stuff. So I don't think religion's morals actually are helping as much as they think they are. What are your thoughts? Oh, yeah, absolutely. It's actually the more secular nations, with a few exceptions like China, uh, are actually more moral and more giving in a lot of ways. But that idea, that feeling that you have this uh, easy to understand objective basis of this God lawgiver out there telling you that you have this objective standard makes people feel comfortable. Kind of like you mentioned having that uh, blankie or uh, stuffed animal when you're a kid, that feeling that it's really easy for human beings to imagine a big mind out there and to be comforted by having that parent or father figure who's going to protect you and or have a ground uh, reality for you. And so because you have that standard it makes it very easy emotionally to uh, hold on to that idea here we have an objective morality because the big sky daddy says so and that's easy for people to understand and until sure. we can find like a an equivalent or better uh secular model of morality then that comforting feeling is going to uh play in people's minds as an explanation for something that we haven't solved yet just like evolution was back before we understood it or back for back how god was an explanation of the diversity of species before we understood evolution I mean, if morality, and I'm I'm going to bring, I mean, we, I'm sure you're tired of the morality questions and stuff from theists, but I'm going to speak kind of with you openly as atheist here. In, in the morality ideas, I'm with you on that. I, I think morality is going to continue to change, though, the way we evolve as a society and how we 
you know, it's objective in the temporary subjective uh, arena of that society, if you will. But there's certain things I think we should all draw lines on, like murdering. If we're trying to evolve and become better species, I don't think murdering should ever be okay. You look at the animal kingdom in the way that, you know, um, there's a patriarchal system and the monkey that's at the top ends up having to fight the up and coming monkey and he has to kill him. It's a fight to the death to reign over the tribe. That evolutionary stuff, if you will, that we've, we, we carry that we've carried these baggages with us as well. We're trying to evolve past that. And so I guess what my question would be, what in your personal own life do you think is the best, um, so far without having a Darwinian uh, philosopher, if you will, trying to explain why we, uh, our morality and how that works in an atheistic worldview. What do you think the best thing for us to do would be right now? What's your best guess on the morality question with atheists? What do you think we should do? Well, I think morality is objective. So I, uh, most philosophers are moral realists, which means they believe morality is objective and can be true independent of minds or opinions. And we can do that without a God. So we don't need a God for that. It's kind of like, uh, Fitness. Fitness is a feature of animals. Animals are more fit if they can survive in more environments. And that's something that's true, independent of our opinion, subjective. And so just like fitness describes interactions between an animal or an organism and its environment, morality describes interactions between agents in an environment. I think, now obviously we don't have any hard evidence for, for morality yet. It's an unsolved problem in philosophy. But it's kind of like a, a distant thing we're seeing. We have these feelings that killing people for fun is wrong. We feel that it's called our moral intuitions. And based on these moral intuitions, it's a sensation kind of like if we see, if we're standing on in a desert, in the middle of a desert, and we see like a, what looks like an ocean off in the distance. Uh, we can't, we obviously, we're not close enough to see if it's real or not. It could just be a mirage. And so we have to sit back here and try and think, well, is it real? Is it just a mirage? And we have to like analyze what, which part of it is, uh, what, what should we do? Should we go towards it? Should we not go towards it? And we're doing the same thing with morality. We all, we all have these, in, these feelings of moral intuition that we see off in the distance that we can't analyze yet. And they're all different. So be, many people have many different moral intuitions, just like when people see a, a mirage, they see like different things in the mirage, different colors. So it's not always the same. And there's different hypotheses. Maybe it's just an illusion in our minds just same, and not real at all, subjective. Or maybe it's a real thing. Maybe there's really an ocean there. Maybe there's a really a morality there. And the way to test this is you'd say, if there's really a morality there, then I'll be able to predict as we get closer to it, the way it'll appear. So, so right now it appears a certain way. And as we get closer to it, it's going to appear a different way. And as we get right up next to it, it'll appear a different way. And so if we have a model of morality that can predict the way our moral intuitions are going to change over time uh, and lead to uh, moral progress in the future, then that's a good model. That, that that's a good basis to conclude that that model understands reality. Uh, so like we, we see moral progress all throughout human history, uh, women's rights, gay rights, voting rights, eliminating slavery. It seems like that as time goes on, as a species, we are trying to make the world a more moral place. And so if we can predict, well, what is that going to look like in the future? hundred years, 500 years, a thousand years. And what is the features of what causes us to move in that direction? If we can predict what's going to happen in the future, then that's a really good basis to say that, that this model that's doing the predicting, like in science is far better than any other model or like a God model who just says it, it's immoral to eat shellfish. And that's objectively true. It'll never change. <laughs> Now, that's a good point, actually. And you made me think I've never really thought of it in those terms. So it's really got me thinking. And and right now, <clears throat> I um I feel like morality is subjective. Uh, but as a system, I, 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 it's hard for me to pin it down. But I mean, the way you were technical about that makes me think really heavy. I think it's interesting how society has evolved past the biblical morality because that's really the worldview i came from with slavery i mean the recent debate of dr joshua bowen and matt delahunte with cliff and his son oh my goodness Stuart, yep. i don't yeah and i don't even know those guys they're probably great people man they probably are wonderful guys but the uh i think that morally speaking murdering people on air like that is just <laughs> yeah matt matt and uh uh Shoot, what's his name? Did Dr. Josh. Body, Dr. Yeah. Josh. They were they were horribly immoral. It was totally immoral how, how badly they just massacred. <laughs> there was... Dude, that was a really, really good debate about how slavery was 
it was it was okay to God, you know. It wasn't uh, it wasn't something he condemned, and that would have been what we would expect from someone who knows the future and knows what's right and wrong. And humanity has a better morality compass than Yahweh at this point, and that's what's really got me going. Hmm. I wonder where we'll be at in a thousand years and what we'll try and figure out. I do like that we're continuously using natural means to try and understand and answer questions. I was watching a show how they're genetically modifying people. They're figuring out how they're figuring out how to go into the embryo and literally find the, the, the defective genes and replace them. And I can't remember the name of this uh, particular thing that they have, but it's getting Casper, scary. Chris, Chris, yes. Casper something. Yeah, what are your thoughts on that? As CRISPR, an atheist, CRISPR Cas9, that's it. Yes. What do you think? Do you think we're going to end up one day screwing ourselves over playing too much with this stuff or what? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's with every technology, there's always going to be mishaps no matter what. It's necessarily going to be the case. Uh, I don't think it's going to destroy humanity. There's other technologies that are much more likely to do that, but even those are more likely to benefit humanity than to destroy humanity. So I think it's a, going to be a net positive. That we're going to be genetically manipulating people to eliminate diseases. That's a good thing. Um, and I don't think we should really be worried about the consequences. There are going to be consequences, and those are terrible. But just like vaccines, yeah. vaccines can cause side effects and harm people. But the net positive that they provide to society is significantly better than the negative. Interesting. Interesting. Well, if you were able to, <clears throat> let's just say, you had a chance to hang out with a famous atheist who died of cancer. Uh, what is his name? Hitchens. Hitchens. Yes. I can't even believe I couldn't think of his name. Um, what would you, what would be the one thing if he was alive right now that you could sit and talk with him? What would, what would it be that you would want to ask him? Uh, I'd probably just ask him to give me his favorite bourbon or something. <laughs> He'd but yeah, appreciate so, that. Yeah. Yes. I'm not a real social person. So that's actually one of those questions. Like uh, they asked that a bunch of times in schools in high school, grade school, like who, if you could invite anybody over for dinner, who would you invite? And I always like, I don't even understand how to answer this question. Like, cause I've, I've never uh, enjoyed speaking to people or getting to know people in that way. I kind of find it boring and not interesting because of my depression. And so I always, I never felt any desire to really just be around people and hang out. It's something I struggle with emotionally. And that's why I don't have a big social network. And it's the thing I'm missing most in life, trying to find people who can help me be more social and meet hot blondes preferably. But uh, so that's, that's one of those questions that is very weird for me because I've never actually had a desire to really just hang out with somebody that go to dinner and just talk about stuff. I've always been, it's a strange thing for me. I'm kind of with you. Uh, I'm more of a social guy, of course, but I'm kind of with you in that respect. I do like my own space. I'm a little introverted. I think over the years that's happened. It could be mental health. I don't know. I've never been diagnosed, but uh, I see that you play video games. So that that whole getting lost into the world of a virtual game, I'm big into that as well myself, but I don't want to take us there. We're talking atheism and I don't want to bore our audience. Um, <clears throat> is atheism a belief system? can be it's uh dependent on each individual person as a person you get to define your position however you want you could take the uh, atheist position as to be a belief system that encompasses many things like uh humanism or secularism or the positive belief there is no gods you as an individual get to define your position however you want so if you define atheism as a belief system then that it is, that's what it is for you and if you define it as a lack of a belief what that doesn't entail any other beliefs then that's what it is for you it's kind of like the theist. The theist gets to define their position how they want. It's one of these the things I one of the things I dislike about atheists is when they say faith is a belief without evidence. I mean, even though that can be true, uh, if the theist who is the one who has the position says, I define faith as a belief with some kind of evidence, then they get to tell you that that's their position. And it's equally as wrong for the atheist to say, No, that's that's wrong. Faith is a belief without evidence, as it is for the theist to say, atheism is the belief that there is no God. Like, like you can't tell the other person what they believe you have to accept their definitions even if they're strange definitions uh, or it's going to straw man their position so i think that atheism can be a belief system just like faith can be a belief with evidence it just depends on the person who's using the term to describe their position so it's better to get past the definitions allow them that permiss permission if you will to say that they have evidence that they believe then challenge the evidence really instead of trying to argue over a definition for 800 minutes 
you know, it's good to just go, okay, we'll permit you that. Okay. So what's this evidence and how does that connect with your theism? And so going from there and seeing if it's rational and if it works is what you're going to do. I love that. Um, a lot of times theists and maybe the, the atheists are wrong for this too, but I've definitely acknowledged that theists want to, it's almost like they feel like they got you. And I don't know why, if they did have you admit, Oh, it's a belief system because they want to make it this thing where you're an atheist. Cause you hate God. You want to not believe in God. And that's, tell me more about this. What does that frustrate you? Uh, not really. So I don't really, care i don't really take it personally what their arguments are i really don't care like if i debate darth dawkins and mr batman like the most crazy cringy people alive but it doesn't bother me at all the approach they take because i'd see it as more of a game like a video game like you mentioned so i just sit there and uh, am ready for whatever strategy the theist wants to throw at me and i just see if i can how i can handle it and it's more of a for entertainment value than anything so i don't really care if they try to misrepresent my position or anything like that it's mostly just for entertainment value i imagine that if i did take it seriously or take it personally then it would frustrate me and i can understand why many people who are atheists in these debates and are misrepresented by the theists do find it frustrating because they are trying to um identify themselves with some kind of a worldview and, and articulate their own personal values and identity to other people. And so being misrepresented in that context can be very frustrating. I can definitely understand that. Uh, but my position is I really don't, my goal is just an entertainment value. So I don't have to, I don't have as much uh, weight in the, the, the conversation where I, if they misrepresent me, I really just don't care. Interesting. Wow. Okay. What is the worst debate you've been in? With one of those two guys? No, Jay Dyer was the worst because he just wouldn't stop talking. Like if you can't make a point and you're just like yelling at each other the entire time, that's just, it's just pointless. Like, I, cause I, the point of the debates is really to demonstrate my epistemology. Cause I wrote an epistemology and model of morality. And the whole point of my debating uh, and, and specifically debating professors is to demonstrate how effective my epistemology is at the highest academic levels. But if someone's just going to scream at you the whole time and not let you like present your arguments or uh, counter their arguments, well, it's kind of just pointless. I saw you debate an Indian. Uh, maybe he wasn't an Indian. He might've, I think he was a Muslim actually. And he was trying to argue why the Quran or why this is the true religion. And you were like, okay, <laughs> you were having no crap, bro. Like, like you were so short with this guy. You were like, Okay, listen, I'm going to keep interrupting you if you don't make a point. Um, you said there's like four points as to why they stopped. Uh, alcoholism has dropped in the community. Like, I mean, like, you know, they started. Those are the most uh, black things I've ever heard, man. Man, those four facts about bees. Whoa, blew my mind. Man, <laughs> did you know that female bees leave the hive? Oh, my God. And bees, they eat fruit. Therefore, Allah. Yeah, that was the weirdest connection I've ever heard anyone try to make an argument for God. Like, at least William Lane Craig is going with some Kalam cosmological argument or someone's trying. They're trying. But bro, like the refrigerator hums and we've <laughs> lowered the humming of the refrigerator. I just don't see how that worked. But uh, in his head, it works. I don't know. Yeah, it's uh, the, he has a very unique approach that is at least entertaining it's almost like if I can do something that makes people improve their life based on what we think improving life is, that's evidence for the divine in my, my view. And it's almost like the ancients thought the same way. Like if an army conquered us, their God won the war. Therefore we probably need to adopt their God. I mean, that was something that was common back in the day. I could see that, but like, well, usually it was the other way around. It was more like, uh, we conquered you guys, therefore our God wins. And so if we're, you're going to worship our God or we're going to kill you all. That's true too. Yeah. Yeah. Or they would adopt the, the, the standards in some sense, but most of the time, if they, unless they were, if they were enslaved, then that would be something they would do. It just depends on the scenario, how bees prove Allah is, you know, God, that was weird. I, I just figured I'd bring that up. What's your favorite all time atheist debate you watched? Is there a single one that stands out among all? The William Link Craig, Sean Carroll debate. I think it was the most informative and especially on the topic of cosmology and debunking William Lane Craig's arguments. I think that was probably the best one. Wow. How bad do you think he won on a scale from one to 10? How bad do you think uh, William Lane Craig got beat? 10 means slaughtered. One means he got, you know, he 
he punched him a couple times. Oh, de- definitely like a nine. Like the the part where William Lane Craig, he always uses this argument about the board Guth Lincoln theorem. Um, and then Sean Carroll had a picture of one of the authors saying, No, William Lane Craig is wrong about this on screen right after he said that, which was just hilarious. That that's like a mic drop moment. Sean Carroll was epic in that. Oh my gosh. Everyone needs to go watch that now. You make me want to watch it. I'm a big fan of what's going on. I didn't realize when I was a Christian listening to these atheists, my cognitive dissonance was working hard, bro. Like I was watching William Lane Craig, uh, you know, the favorite um, uh, Ravi Zacharias, you know what I'm saying? All these guys, man, I, I like cherished all their works. I listened to them. I bought CDs. I read their books. Like I was a big fan and I, I saw how the atheists were wrong, but what the hell happened, man? I like, just a little bit of hard life, a little bit of critical thinking and uh, the scientific method. I'm saying, you know, is this true? I, I had a personal painful experience trying to get off drugs and I finally came to a conclusion. What if I'm wrong? Just being curious and open-minded gave me that vision that I can like actually observe and go, the atheists actually have a very valid point. Have I ever seen Yahweh? no. If I did, was I on drugs? I've seen some shit, man. I'm not going to lie. I've, I've done you know, things that have made me see things, but I can't act like the brain doesn't already have these chemicals as well naturally. So whether I took something or not, people hallucinate all the time. And I hated Richard Dawkins. I, I mean, like the Christian man who's like, sir, he's like in the crowd crying to Richard Dawkins. I have met the Lord 54 years of my life. And he's like, what is wrong? What do you think is wrong? And he's like, I think you're suffering from delusion of hallucination. And I'm like, what a dick. Now I'm looking back going, sir, you're, um, you're suffering from a hallucination, sir. Like what happened? Uh, Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, Dawkins is absolutely hilarious because he's, he's so terse in the way he says things like, he's not trying to be an asshole. He's just extremely abrupt in the way he talks. Like many people who are extremely intellectual, their their social skills are usually uh, not, not, as uh kind and polite they usually just if they have an opinion they just tell you immediately without any any padding in there no no beating around the bush and that's essentially richard dawkins which is why people think he's an asshole because he just says immediately what he says uh based on his understanding of biology which is fairly accurate so uh, he's definitely not he's a very nice old man uh, a very kind old man who just comes off as very mean because he's very very uh, terse in what he says but yeah it's it's a really interesting phenomenon that when you are religious and you look at these arguments uh, they seem so strong so ironclad and then if you lose your faith and you come back and really think about them like oh wait these weren't actually that good why did i think they were so good back then and you you realize that it was really your inability to question the argument you had such faith in this god being as being so powerful that anything that seemed to indicate the god being was perfect and and infallible. So there's this infallible argument that indicates the God. And it really would take uh, the ability to challenge your own beliefs to cause you to really look at them and see the flaws from the atheist perspective. Like even Newton experienced the same thing when he uh, discovered the cylindrical orbits around the solar system. He said, the famous famous quote, that uh, it would be impossible for him to calculate all of the independent orbits uh, using calculus and, and must have been done by a god. And then, of course, uh, Laplace came but a couple hundred years later and did exactly that and calculated it just fine and then went up to uh, Napoleon. And Napoleon asked him, where is your god in this model? And his famous response was, I had no need of that hypothesis. So everyone is, even the smartest people in the world are subject to that kind of a bias. We have this unabating faith in this idea of a super powerful uh, God or whatever, then it makes you, it blinds you from being able to question critically what the next step in the system is. Like as many scientists have said, God stops innovation because if you think a God did it, then you stop looking for the natural solution. That was really well put. It makes me think of that whole argument you recently said on <clears throat> why, po- why people believe in these things, superstitions and gods, that there was an evolutionary, um, component to us that, uh, 
a lot of, and I, I can't remember the name of these guys. I'm horrible with names. Uh, he was actually the Richard Dawkins Foundation doing a presentation explaining why we evolved, believing in things we can't see. And it's just natural to draw those conclusions and fill the gaps in. And what is that process called? Or what is it that you were saying in the debate not too long ago with, um, uh, it was a godless engineer. You were talking about how you believe that there is an evolutionary product that kind of gives us that, uh, component of filling in the gaps and explaining what we don't understand with the divine or something fills that gap. Yeah. Michael Shermer, uh, he used this analogy in, I think it was a Ted talk. Uh, it's that the reason many of us believe there is a God, the reason that so many humans, uh, have a proclivity to believe in gods and spirits and ghosts and whatever is because we are hyperactive agency detectors. Like if back in the day when we were hunter gatherer societies, if we heard a rustle in the bushes and we thought, Hey, that's probably the wind. Yeah, it's just a wind. We're, we're going to stay around. If it was actually a lion, well then we would get eaten and die. And so that's, that's not very, not a very good strategy, but the people who heard the rustle in the bushes and thought, Oh, that's a lion. Even if it was the wind would run away even there, if there was a lion or not. And so they would always think there's this agent there, like an evil lion trying to get us, and they would survive. And so the the groups of people who who always thought, oh, look, it's a lion, we should run away, are the ones who survived and reproduced, leading to us. And the ones who were skeptical, the skeptical atheist types back then, thought, you know, it's probably just the wind. I'm, I'm going to wait for more evidence. Well, they got eaten, so, so they're not with us anymore. And so we have evolved this hyperactive agency detector of thinking that everything we can't understand, it must have some kind of a mind behind it. And that's why uh, religious belief and spiritual beliefs and uh, monsters under the bed and imaginary friends and blankies that we can hold, that's why those things give us all this comfort is because of that evolutionary advantage that was given to the people who saw Russell in the bushes, oh, it's a mind run away. And, and that's the basis of all of our superstitious beliefs. Damn. <laughs> that's a good point that's a real good point i was reading job from the bible yesterday to my sister-in-law because i don't know why i feel like it's a mission of mine to kind of point some stuff out to her as a fundamentalist christian but she listens i give her that and i was reading about job when god comes out and pretty much says my junk is bigger than your junk okay and that's really what job comes down to job's didn't do anything wrong. He just said he didn't want to be born. Like he wished he wasn't born. You know, he had to suffer all the stuff. God comes out of the whirlwind and he's like, who is this that darkens counsel with words? You know, grab your loins like a man and get ready to answer me. Like it sounds like a dictator came out of the whirlwind and he starts flexing on Job. Do you make the lightning in the cloud? You know, all these things. And I'm thinking to myself, like these natural explanations, whoever the author of Job was, they're all thinking these beyond us agents. Lightning's probably an agent to them. Volcanoes are an agent. They don't have a natural uh, system in, in, in place where they understand how these things work. They have to say the divine. They give that attribute the divine. And the more we've learned scientifically, we've been able to resolve those problems naturally without having to give that to the boogeyman or give that to Satan or give that to Yahweh or other gods, et cetera, et cetera. Would you uh, like to add to that? Yeah, that's. I mean, that's absolutely right, is that uh, the idea that those things are were gods punishing us, like lightning hitting somebody, think, oh, he must have pissed off the god to get him to the lightning bolt him or Pompeii getting uh, zapped by the volcano. Oh, they must've done something to piss off the gods. People would always explain any like catastrophic events, tsunamis, hurricanes, tornadoes. Uh, that's even, even in recent times, there were some like Republican candidates who thought the tsunamis were punishments for uh, America allowing homosexuality. They said that on many news anchors all the time. So this <laughs> idea that, uh, we can do things to piss off the gods and the gods are going to use the natural forces to destroy us is a, a really common idea, even though it's extremely stupid. Because if there was a god, he could do the the Pine Creek. He just poof us out of existence. Why is he drowning us? Why, why is he zapping us with lightning? This doesn't make any sense. Apparently, the god just likes using the world to destroy us instead of his magical powers. So he, he uses them indirectly, apparently. Uh, he's not going to just he's not going to make a wand, do Avada Kedava. No, no, he's going to use a tornado. That's that's a genius way to do it. 
Well, I think that could, and using Pine Creek's method, we could really poke a serious hole at the theist who try to argue, well, he uses natural means. Not always. There's a story where David, and there's differing stories between Samuel and Chronicles in the situation that Yahweh, you know, tempted him to number the children of Israel or Satan. And some people, Christians, there's a lot of uh, Marcionite type Christians. And I thought that episode was great with, um, with, uh, uh, Doug, where he talks about this, the Marcionite guy was like, look, Yahweh is Satan, is exactly what Marcionite, you know, believed, and that Jesus' father was a different one. He's the true God because he's all loving and he doesn't do what Yahweh did. Well, in that story, he numbers the children of Israel sinning against God because he, he didn't trust in God. Instead, he wanted to count his men to make sure that he's got enough guys for battle. And the angel of the Lord comes and strikes them. Now, what that means is up for dispute. Is this a plague that hit, you know, Israel? Is that what is that what they're trying to say? It seems there are places though where they're able to see angels, fiery people with swords and shields in the mountains. I mean, even Josephus seems to sound like, well, when the when 70 AD came and the Romans were in conquering Jerusalem, I saw angels in the heavens. I saw uh soldiers with shields and swords and they were ready to fight battling in the heavens. To me, it's like why don't we see any of that? What you know, none of that ever happens. And that started to strengthen my skepticism, which leads me to more conclusions on saying the probability of a God not existing is is very low. In fact, I want to ask you, because you have a different conclusion in terms of the strength of your atheism, say, versus godless engineer. It sounded like godless engineer is more soft. You have more of a harder atheism, and you think you're you stand harder on it than he does. Is that well, in that in that debate, we we have a very similar position. In that debate, I was taking the hard atheist position for the sake of the argument, so that the theist could address either version of atheism, because uh, the debate was whether atheism was rational or something like that. And if me and Godless Engineer both took the lack theism definition, but the athe but the theists were taking the hard atheist definition, like which is what they did and what most theists do, then it would cause just we'd be debating definitions for an hour, like you mentioned. That's extremely boring. So I just decided I'll take I'll take the strong atheist position. I'll say God definitely does not exist for the sake of the argument, even though I'm more of a methodological atheist, much like Godless Engineer. I think that. I don't usually make claims about what does or doesn't exist fundamentally. I just you claim what what is the epistemic basis of our evidence, and then that's the that's really what matters, not really the claims about what really truly exists. So uh, I usually take something similar to Godless Engineer, but yeah, you can definitely justify the belief that God definitely does not exist, which is what many of the atheist philosophers take, like Alex Malpass, Ozzy, those kind of guys. Uh, Grandma OP. They're like strong atheists who believe God does not exist. And the way you do that is you can say there's lots of contradictions in the properties of God. And the way I do it is I say, if you don't have any evidence that the thing exists independent of our imagination, then it's reasonable to conclude that that thing is only imaginary. It's only in our heads. And if there's no way to show that that thing is true independent of our imagination, then it's perfectly fine to just say it's purely imaginary and it doesn't exist. That's interesting. I know a lot of people will try to uh, straw man you on hard atheism. And so, yeah, I do appreciate you responding to that because I didn't know exactly where you stood on that. So hard atheism, they'll say, isn't it's not a rational conclusion because you can't you can't be certain that God doesn't exist. Now, can you can you dispel that uh, that fluff that they're putting up right there? Yeah, you don't need certainty for knowledge. So no one says that, well, if you're not certain, well, then you don't know. Like, that's not a thing in philosophy or science. The The consensus position is called fallibilism. Fallibilism is the position that you don't need certainty for knowledge. So, like, we can know we're not in the matrix. We can know we're not a brain in the vat because the the we have justification. We have justificatory evidence that this is the real world based off of our interactions with it, based off the test of the predictions we can make given the hypothesis that the world is real. Uh, even though it doesn't give us certainty, it does give us justification and knowledge is a justified true belief. So as long as you have a belief and it's justified and it happens to be true, then you have knowledge even if the justification isn't certain. Two more things and then I'm going to let you go here because I really do enjoy uh, listening to you debate other people. Of course, this is just a discussion about atheism, and I'm really wanting to like probe out of you some ideas here. Number one, I'm interviewing Jesus uh, next week sometime. There's a guy in Australia who says he's Jesus, 
And so I'm going to interview him. I'm going to be super nice. I'm not, I'm not going to do S, uh, epistemological challenging, you know, things like that. I am going to ask some questions up front to get the initial interview going, but then I'm going to just pretend that he's Jesus and ask him questions and, and probe into his mind. Okay. Uh, do you have a comment you'd like to make on that? Uh, yeah, that would be definitely be interesting to see what questions you could ask him. Like, uh, what would he do? What would he do if there's that, the revelation part where Jesus, where the world's going to be perfect for a thousand years or whatever, I would ask, what is he going to do to make the world of that? Like, what are the things that he's going to change about the world? And then I'd say, if he could compare it to my, my model of the best of all possible worlds and see which one's better, see if I'm, I know more about morality than Jesus does. That would be an interesting test. <laughs> interesting. Yeah, I'm excited to ask him. I think he thinks some of the books aren't accurate in their mythology. He admits the Bible's not, like he, he admits it's been tampered with and it's not right, which will be interesting to get him to. This is He believes he's the second coming of Jesus. He's actually a really nice guy. Uh, you'd be shocked if you were talking to him. But I think personally, I mean, this is my not being derogatory, but uh, I think he's delusional. I do. And I think a lot of people are. Don't get me wrong. I don't mean that in a bad set, bad way. You yeah, know? I think there's been a, a, about a thousand second comings of Jesus so far. Wow. I didn't know that. Yeah, there's this one guy in Russian, Venerian, Vasarian, something. Yeah, I'm trying he, to get him on too. He, he, would, be, he would be hilarious to have on. <laughs> I think he got arrested recently, though, from Russia because they don't play games over there. So, yeah. That would be cool to get on. Last question I have. Um, it's going to boil down to this. I saw a debate with Matt Delahunte and Mike Lacona. Mike Lacona had a really good debate with him. Um, they couldn't get past this this one part. And you know, Matt gets frustrated when he has to repeat stuff sometimes. And and uh I felt like um I I don't know if I would have answered the same way Matt was answering it, but maybe I could be wrong. I want your response on this. Maybe you can give me your two cents. What would it take? for you to believe. Okay. Matt kept fighting Mike Lacona on this. And it was like, uh, he's like, what would it take? Jesus appears to you. What would it take for you to change your mind and say, okay, I, I believe that there's a God. And not only do I believe there's a God, I believe it's Jesus right here. What would it take for you personally to finally to conclude that? Yeah, that's actually a really interesting question because it has two parts to it. Like the, the first thing is what would it take for you personally to believe? Now, that's a really hard question to answer because if you don't, if you like saw God write his name in the sky, would you actually believe that was a God? Or, you know, it's, you don't know. It could go either way because you're trying to assess your beliefs and your past evidence and how it affects you at the time period. It's really hard to answer what's going to cause you personally to change your belief system. But the question that theists are really asking there is, would it be reasonable for someone to believe if what something happened? Like, give me an example of something that would make it reasonable for someone to believe a God is real. Because what they're trying to do is they're trying to conflate the idea that if you can't give an answer to what would convince you, therefore, it's there's nothing that could ever convince you. That That's their claim, which is obviously wrong. That's That's not... The thing that's not what Matt is saying. Matt is just saying he doesn't know that if some event happened that it would convince him personally, because that's really that's that's the honest answer. You don't really know what would convince you personally, mm -hmm. but uh, they they want to imply that because you can't answer that question, that it's impossible. That there's nothing in your worldview or your epistemology would allow for evidence of God, and that's wrong. I think even Matt would admit that is wrong, and so. The two questions or the two answers from my perspective is what would actually convince me would be like uh, essentially hot blondes. Like if I prayed to God and got hot blondes, I would I would pray to Jesus. I, I would I would convert I would convert to flat Earth if, if that works. I don't, I don't care. But uh, but honestly, like what would make it reasonable to believe in a God? Well, that would just be like no, any kind of novel testable prediction like that we hold science the standard to. So like if you could pray to a God and he would heal limbs at a higher rate than chance, that's a good reason to believe that there's probably a God. If you could pray to God and he give you a gold brick, a uh, higher rate than chance, that's that's a good reason to believe in God. Like there are definitely like prayer studies that if they came out as having a significant positive impact, that would be good evidence that there's probably a God out there. So there's lots of ways that we could show there is evidence of a God, um, but it becomes more complicated when you try to ask answer the question of what would personally convince you. Theists shouldn't answer that question. It shouldn't ask that question. They should ask right. the question about what would be reasonable. If something, if something happened, what would make it reasonable for a person to believe? 
Right. And, and I'll give you mine. My great grandfather, um, or actually my grandfather, on my father's side has been dead over a year and a half. If he came back from the dead right now and, you know, literally showed up at the house and was, Hey, I'm back. And he's, and he came back and I knew this is him. Uh, that would give me very, very good reason <laughs> to say, you know what? I do think, uh, there's something here. And, um, how is this? Where were you? What did you see? What, you know, that would be quite interesting. I don't know. What about you? I don't know if that would work because he might have had a t twin brother that you just didn't know about, or uh, maybe he just faked his own death just to troll everyone because he got tired of you. He's like, nope, I'm done with this. I want to fake my own death and just hide. <laughs> so uh, for me, it requires novel Tesla prediction. So it couldn't just be something I couldn't explain, like someone coming from back from the dead. It would have to be like, if my God is real, then we can do this experiment to get this result. So if I could pray to God for my de dead grandparents to return from the grave, and they did, that would be good evidence. But just them returning randomly, I'd probably be like, I don't know, this, this is a little this is fishy. Good point, good point. So now you're getting more specific about requirements that would make more sense to be able to rationalize and say, okay, th th it's inevitable. I mean, the statistics and in, in the probability that this happened by chance right after I said this, and he's doing what is practically impossible you know i might as well at this point just drop my atheism and recognize hey there's a god and this is probably the god of the world or whatever you know but yeah no i'm with you that's quite interesting you answered it in a good way that i had not had a response about matt's response to mike lacona but it makes sense what you're trying to say so i appreciate that man yeah absolutely absolutely ladies and gentlemen t jump he got all these answers from his chair behind him, but he pleads the fifth. You guys know he's bull. Sh you know, it's not true. You know, he gets it from the chair. Um, look, I'm going to say some prayers about some blondes for you when we get off of here. And uh, <laughs> I do appreciate you joining me, man, for real. Yeah, absolutely. It's always great having on. I appreciate the invite as always. And I'm still jealous of your hair. Can I kind of like shave it off and steal it? I'm just like, you know, get it to pay. <laughs> just here you go, bro. Um, <laughs> Make sure you guys subscribe to his channel. He's trying to grow this channel and it helps his mental health. Do you want him to go mentally insane? Psh, come on. You guys need to help him. Every like and every comment and every subscriber adds strength to progressively getting better in his mental health. Okay. We need to get him as many people as possible to go over there and join. But seriously, the debates are amazing. The content is wonderful. And you get to hear someone who's like battling on the forefront. You're not just battling top names. You're, you're challenging guys that anyone who's willing to come out and, and debate that's uh, knows how to speak uh, a language that is comprehensible to some degree with you. Right. Uh, most part, there's, there's a few that, uh, that don't, that don't, don't fit that category, but <laughs> So you're willing to fall for you're willing to debate almost anything. Like I could bring a log in here and just set up a, you know, and you could argue with this thing. You think yeah, you'd win? Yeah. I have a open, open, uh, offer on my channel, 50 bucks for anybody to debate me on anything. Like if you just pay me 50 bucks, I'll debate you on whatever you want. Interesting. Take him up on that debate. Ladies and gentlemen, he has a discord. He's got a patron. You guys can help him out. Of course, that always helps us. I know some people who can't stand when we plug stuff like that. They act like, oh, that's all you care about. Well, no, we're just trying to do this full time. We want to be able to uh, not only survive, surviving sounds like a struggle, uh, thrive. We want to make it and go places. And I could see you honestly um, moving into larger auditoriums, doing big stuff, because you've already been deba debating publicly in forums and not just online. So I could see you doing more. Yeah, I did. Uh, so far, I've done three live debates, uh, or four or five, actually. And I've got one more in a week in Georgia, two, two live events in a week in four in Georgia. Do you feel this? I know I'm not supposed to ask any more questions, but do you feel like you've lost any debates? uh i Not guess so. you're wrong but like you yeah know, just it, yeah so like the one with ge he he's extremely well versed on mythicism where i'm not as not nearly as well versed so i think he won that one for sure uh i probably lost the one with uh the 9 11 one because i didn't have as much background information as the guy who i was debating against he he was much well ver more well versed on that topic. Uh, probably my one with Vouch too, because I was super tired and didn't have the intellectual capacity to uh, debate that day because I was about like twenty something hours not sleeping. So those those are some of the debates I probably lost. I can think I could say I lost those debates. Okay.
Well, I appreciate it, man. Thanks so much, T-Jump. And ladies and gentlemen, never forget, we are Myth Vision. I have hundreds of videos on the Patreon. Become a patron and get early access to everything I ever launched. Join the Twitter. I've got a Discord chat room. You guys can help grow the community. One-time PayPal or Cash App if you want to help us out with a donation. And join our Facebook groups, man. Let's make this thing happen.